The foster of the eight sufferings is birth. When a child comes into the world, the only thing it can do is cry. The child can't express itself clearly yet, but its crying indicates suffering. The pain of birth is like the pain of, of the pain a live tortoise would feel if its shell were ripped away. When the infant com- first comes in contact with the air, its pain is extreme. The second of the eight sufferings is old age. When people get old, they lose the use of their eyes, ears, hands, and legs. They can't get around, and their food is tasteless. When old age comes, the whole physical mechanism starts to break down. That's why old people get cranky and cross. They are just about like children, so you can't blame them for their behavior. The third is the suffering of sickness. The things of this world may seem unjust, but sickness is very fair toward all. No matter whether one is rich or poor, of honorable or of lowly birth, one will feel the discomfort of sickness when it strikes. The fourth suffering is death, which is also just in regard to everyone. The time will come when everyone must die, no matter who it is. The fifth is the suffering of being apart from those you love. Everyone knows what love is, but people don't realize that there is suffering in love. The suffering of being apart from those you love. No matter how much you may love a person, the time may come when you have to leave him. Some circumstances will arise that make parting necessary, and that is suffering. The sixth is the suffering of being together with those you hate. You really dislike a certain type of person, but you meet up with just that kind of person no matter where you go. The seventh is the suffering of not getting what you seek. You want something and you can't get it. That is also suffering. The last is the suffering of the blazer of the five skandhas. Forms, feelings, thoughts, activities, and consciousness are a raging blaze. In this passage, the Buddha says that the treasury of the first common is none of the four truths, neither suffering nor accumulation, nor extinction nor the way. Accumulation refers to affliction, and extinction refers to the principle of certification to nirvana. Nor is it the way; it is neither knowing nor attaining. Even wisdom becomes empty. It is not the attaining to some level of fruition. This is the emptiness of the treasury of first come one. There is nothing in it at all. Sweep away all dhammas and separate from all appearances. S- speaking of extinction, I recall something that happened when Shakyamuni Buddha was practicing the Bodhisattva way. When Shakyamuni Buddha was on the causal route, that is, when he was cultivating the way, before he became a Buddha, he met a Rakshasa ghost who said, "All activities are impermanent, characterized by production, production and extinction." He said just this one sentence, these two phrases, and did not say any more. Shakyamuni Buddha recognized it as Buddha Dharma and said, "Brother Ghost, you were just reciting a verse that was Buddha Dharma, but you spoke only two lines of it. There must be two more lines. Can you tell me what they are?" The Ghost said, "You want to hear poetry, but I'm hungry right now. I haven't eaten in ever so long. I'd like to recite the verse for you, but I haven't the strength." Shakyamuni Buddha asked him, "What do you want to eat? I can prepare something for you." The ghost said, "You can't prepare what I eat. Why not? Because I eat human flesh, and there isn't anyone else around here now. Even if there were, you wouldn't have the right to offer him to me to eat." Shakyamuni Buddha said, "Ah, so that's how it is. Well, finish speaking that dharma for me and." I offer you myself to eat. You can eat me. Can you really give up your life? The ghost asked. 
For the sake of the Dharma, I forget my own life. Of course, I can give it up, said the Buddha. So speak up, and when you've finished, you can eat. Are you cheating me? said the ghost, eyeing him closely. After I speak the Dharma, will you change your mind and be unable to relinquish your own life to make up my meal? Absolutely not, the Buddha said. Don't worry, after you speak the Dharma and once I remember it clearly, you will let, I will let you eat me. So the Rakshasa ghost said the last two lines of the verse. When production and extinction are extinguished, that still extinction is bliss. Then the Rakshasa ghost said, All right, I've spoken the Dharma, let me eat you. Shakyamuni Buddha said, Wait a minute, don't eat me yet. See, said the ghost, I knew you'd back out, but it won't work. I'll have to become impolite with you. I'm not backing out, said the Buddha, wait until I write the four lines of further down, and then you can eat me. Then even though I will be gone, I'll have preserved this drama so that others who come after me can rely on it in their cultivation. So wait a minute. Fine, said the ghost, start writing. The Buddha carved the verse into the bark of a tree. As soon as the ghost saw he had finished, he said, Now I can eat you, right? Wait a bit longer, said the Buddha. You've carved it in the tree and people who come along can read it. What more do you want? What are we waiting for now? The Buddha said, I don't think that the carving in the tree will last long. Wait a bit while I cut the verse in a rock, then it will last forever. Then you can eat me. Sure, said the ghost. You've got a lot of excuses. You're just procrastinating. But do as you like. Shakyamuni Buddha found a way to carve the verse in a stone. Then he said invitingly to the ghost, I'm finished. I've done what I needed to do. You can eat me now. The Rakshasa ghost said, Really? You can really let me eat you? So he opened his mouth as if to take a bite, but he suddenly ascended into the empty space and went to the heavens. He was actually a god who had come to test Shakyamuni Buddha to see just how sincere he really was about the Dharma. And Shakyamuni Buddha proved himself. He was able to forget his own life for the sake of the Dharma. He could sacrifice his life in order to preserve the Buddha Dharma. In the past, the Buddha renounced his life for half a verse. Look at us now. We listen to the sutras and hear Dharma, but we don't understand it very well, so we think it better to rest. See how lazy we are. Why did Shakyamuni Buddha become a Buddha? It was because he could forget about himself for the sake of the Buddha. He would disregard everything else for the sake of the Dharma. He didn't want anything. If you are really sincere about the Dharma, you will seek it so sincerely that you will be able to drop everything, even things that you thought it impossible to do without. A few days ago, a disciple of mine called me four or five times long distance from New York He's very unusual. He always wants to see me. He was about 13 when he took refuge with me. Before that, he had had some strange experiences. Although he was young, he had heart disease. The doctors prescribed five years of complete bed rest. He was not to get up at all. He wasn't supposed to walk even a few feet. It was during that period that he saw a photograph of me while his relatives and friends recited Namo Amitabha Buddha. He recited one of my names, Namo Dhamma Master to Burn. Namo means to offer up one's life in reverence. He'd recited sitting in full lotus on his bed. His sincerity was unusual for such a small child and he kept up that recitation for more than 70 days. Then he saw the photograph turn into a live person who stretched out his hand and rubbed the boy on the crown of his head. 
After that, his heart disease and all the symptoms of his illness disappeared. But that time, he never even met me. This may sound like a tale, a tall tale, but it was his own personal experience. After he was killed, killed, he came to my temple to meet me. He took refuge and then sat in meditation. I didn't usually teach meditation when I was in Hong Kong. If someone wanted to investigate Chen, they did it on their own. So he did. He went to school, and during recess or breaks from classes, he would go off into the hills to meditate, or even into the bathroom wherever he could find a place. After about a year, he opened his Buddha eye, and then he then understood extremely clearly all manner of things that were going on. Another strange thing happened. With this same disciple, he was always very short, probably because of his earlier illness. But his English was good, and when Americans came to visit me, I would have him translate for me. Despite his fluent English, though, Americans didn't take him seriously because they saw he was such a small child. So one day I said to him, "Hurry up and grow up." You're so short that everything thinks of you as just a kid, and no matter how eloquent you are, they don't take you seriously. He was very obedient. He went home, and in one week grew three inches. Now he's taller than I am. A few days ago, he called me and wanted me to come to New York to see him, but because I was lecturing the sutra for all of you, I told him I couldn't come. Even though he wanted to see me very badly, I'm lecturing the sutras now. I said, and I can't abandon the whole group of people just because one person wants to see me. If you really want to see me, come to San Francisco. He decided to come to San Francisco, but then found that he didn't have enough time. So yesterday he called to tell me he was leaving, if it weren't for lecturing the sut. Brahma Sutra. If it weren't for the sake of the Dharma, I would really like to see that disciple of mine. He has a lot of faith in me and really knows a lot of Buddha Dharma. When he was in Hong Kong, he used to translate my lectures into Cantonese, and he was so in tune with me that if I said just one sentence, he could pick up on it and explain the entire meaning. People objected and said. The old boy didn't say all that. Was he doing talking so much? Actually, I had told him to explain all that he was explaining, because he had the Buddha eye. He knew that I was telling him to explain the principles in detail. What he would say is the same as what I would have said, and so I was a little lazy and let him do the talking.